All right. So thanks for joining me, everyone. This is uh, Family Law Software Back to Basics. I'm John Zoller. It's uh, August 20th, and there's still people in the waiting room. Sorry. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Malice. Hi, Mary Ellen. John. Good to see you. Great to see uh, you. So anybody can interrupt me at any time, uh, but this is, uh, we invited all the people who have uh, had trial subscriptions over the last three to six months. Um, and it's really kind of, let's start from the beginning. And I'm, I will touch on one specific question I got this week from a subscriber, but basically we're just gonna go through the flow of the software and, and how it works. So what you're looking at right now is uh, the cloud version of the software. Uh, some of you might be using the desktop version. The differences between the desktop and the cloud are $10 a month, um, but you don't have to update it. Um, it stores your data for you. You can retrieve it from anywhere. Um, and there's a few little uh, differences in the way that the fit and feel and, and functionality. For example, when you change a, a variable relating to child support in the, in the desktop version, it's on the bottom. And on the cloud version, it's up here at the top. Let me uh, highlight my, uh, there, my cursor. Now you can see it better. So that's just one of the differences between the cloud version and the desktop version. And as we go along, I'll, I'll point out some more. So uh, files and settings, this is where you get started. Uh, typically, you're going to go to open, save, and send. Um, here's where you can open a prior file. Um, these little blue question marks give you uh, guidance on what it, wherever you are. They're peppered throughout the software, and I encourage you to look at them often because it'll help you. If nothing else, it'll just reaffirm your suspicion that you're in the right place and doing the right thing. Okay. Um, online client files. This is a new feature. Uh, it's been around... Uh, it's been updated about four months ago and it's really working great. So this is, this is a system whereby you can have your clients enter data. And um, I used to tell people that this was for a relatively narrow band of clients, those who were computer savvy and had the financial data themselves. I'm not saying that anymore because I find that, that lots of people appreciate the opportunity to fill out the forms themselves. So when I say forms, this is putting in data concerning their assets, their liabilities, their income and expenses. Um, a lot of times you'll get garbage back from your client, but a lot of time you'll get a lot of information. Rarely is it so complete that you don't do anything to it. Um, if you happen to represent a CPA, a lawyer, or an engineer, you might get more data um, than some other people. But uh, to do this, you simply click on register client. You put in your client's email address, their name, their spouse's name. Uh, it will populate the file name for you. You click OK, and the software will send an email to your client inviting them to log into Family Law Software and get started you'll get an email notifying you that it was sent to them. And once they're done and they upload it, you'll get an email letting you know that they've uploaded their data to the cloud. Then you can pull it down in the desktop or just open it if you're in the cloud version. Data is not a static thing. You will uh, make revisions to it. You'll get an appraisal and change the, uh, the value of the real estate. All kinds of things change all of the time. You get more data from a client, you go in and revise it. That will happen as long as you leave this file available for the client to use also. At some point, you're typically going to want to, um, you're going to want to shut the client out. You're going to say, okay, I need to do my work here and I don't want any of it uh, undone or changed and um, I need to go with this to print my Supreme Court forms or my worksheet or whatever it might be. So this is where you would um, save it with a new name and that effectively locks your client out of the other data set. Everybody get that? 
Um, so this is, I'm using this more and more in my practice and, and a much broader range of clients are really enjoying it and appreciate it. Um, the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory. If you've got a bunch of files in the cloud, uh, you just click on this, open one of your files to file. I'll show you what mine look like just so you can see it. So there's a whole list of clients I'm working on and uh, their files. So um, you can change the name, you can delete it. Paper data sheets, boy, if you have a client that wants paper data sheets, I, I pity you, but there they are if they really have to have paper. Um, you can send your file to a CPA that you're working with who uses the software, a financial planner who uses the software, even your opposing counsel. And um, that happens uh, in collaborative practice. We throw the financial data back and forth because we wanna be literally working on the same page. So this is a way to email your file to someone else. So that's, that's this files and settings tab. Um, settings help and support, uh, it's pretty, pretty basic. You can change defaults, um, report options, court info. So if you're always in uh, Franklin County, you can create a default so that it assumes that your pleadings are Franklin County, uh, that sort of thing. And then um, help and support. There are at least six different ways to get help uh, in the software. One of them is to click here and send, the, send them an email. That opens a ticket. Um, and you'll get a response within a day. Um, if you are working with a data set and it is just confounding you and you're stuck and you think the software is doing something wrong or um, you can't figure it out, you can send the file to the company and somebody who knows more about software than me will look at your data and um, call you or email you back with a solution. There are training videos. Um, they're, uh, they're being updated. There's some, I think six or eight brand new ones. There's lots of older ones. Some of them, you know, you might be careful because some of them predate House Bill 366. And so they're old child support videos, but there are lots of them. And they're, it's, it's Dan Kane in the software, moving a mouse around and narrating how you do specific things in each video is specific to a topic. And I'll show you more about that later. And then FAQs, oh my God, there are so many FAQs. So when I clicked on that link, it went to the company's website, which is familylawsoftware.com. And there's, you know, there's just almost too many. There's so many answers to questions here, cloud edition questions, client data entry, storing, sending, printing. Um, there are even, you scroll all the way down. Oh my God, look at them all. How do I enter? There's a bunch of answers. Children, investments, living expenses, pensions. Um, I thought at the end there's states, but yeah. So now at the very end, there's state specific FAQs. So you can go into Ohio. We only have one. Oh, that's old. We'll go over that. That should be deleted because um, it changed. Uh, the, the extrapolation is the same. So anyway, when I clicked on that frequently asked questions, it takes me to the company's website. That also happens when you click on a, a video. And here are the training videos. And um, so those are, these are the specific videos for Ohio. And again, this one should be uh, modified because it's three, 336,000 now, not 150. So you click on these, they're three to five minutes. They're little uh, vignettes about the specific topic that, it, that is, uh, you're clicking on. Um, so that's the files and settings tab, pretty straightforward. I call it the administrative tab, um, but files and settings is good too. Client info, this is where you, we're moving on. Data entry, this is where you, you, you pick up where your client left off or you start yourself. There are um, different schools of thought about the best way to do data entry. Um, I will sometimes do it myself if I really need to learn my client's finances. Um, because boy, if you're putting in values for bank accounts and cars and 
401k plans, guess what? When you're done, you're going to know your client's case. Um, so th there's some value to you doing it yourself. Uh, I have had uh, my paralegals do it, um, and then I look at it, and then, of course, clients do it too. So uh, the first place is clients' uh, child support data, and don't let that fool you because this is also where you, put, you start putting in income and certain deductions. So you would use the child support data part even if you're doing a spousal support only case uh, because that's where you would um, put, in the, put in the client's data. Um, so I had somebody ask me, they were, they were confounded by the child support guideline and they didn't realize that they had accidentally deselected this. And I went on and shared screens with them and I'm looking at their guideline worksheet and I'm like, what is that? It doesn't look right to me. <laughs> I realized it's the, it's, the, it's the vintage child support worksheet. So this is how you go back in time is to click that. If you have a modification of a taxable spousal support uh, order and you want to do uh, after tax spendable cash with taxability on spousal support, you deselect these buttons. Any questions about that? So these are these are back in time buttons. Um, so children, uh, so these are, I call them carrots. They, they open and close. This is the same on the, uh, on the desktop version. You put in the children's names. It's really important to put in their dates of birth because that informs the work-related child care expense limitations. So the software is going to calculate how old these kids are and then adjust for each band of, of maximum child care uh, that, that the child support guidelines allow you to use. Custody for guidelines. This means who's the obligee. All this means is who's going to get the money. Tax exemption straightforward. Sometimes you'll have an adult child, so you deselect here. If there are child, children of another relationship but are living with your client, you want to add them here to affect the, the calculation. And then this is the uh, overnights. And, you know, if you put in, so watch this, uh, oh boy, 1544 is the child support now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to magically give George 90 overnights with this kid, and I'm going to give him... 145 with that kid, and now we're down to 1393. So the, all that did was because these two numbers are both over 90, over 90 or more per year, that gave George the automatic 10% adjustment, and you saw the results right here. This is really helpful when you're doing a live demonstration with your client. If they're sitting in your conference room or more likely now you're sharing your screen on Zoom and they're saying, well, what if I got 10 more overnights? You can show them the effect of that. Or what if I agree to his demand to, for a standard parenting time schedule? Well, you can see the results immediately from the overnights. Another way to calculate overnights is to click that little bed icon and you could just, if, if you were doing a Parenting equalized parenting time. You put seven out of uh, out of fourteen for that child, and seven out of fourteen for this child. And now we've got equalized parenting time, or close to it, right? So this didn't change because there's no formula to calculate a further adjustment just because there are additional overnights. The statute says it's a case by case analysis, but there's a presumption that more than uh, 445 overnights per year warrant a substantial adjustment. So much more than 10%, right? Um, there are ways to extrapolate this overnight conundrum. And we get this call all the time. Uh, well, I have equal parenting time, why isn't it adjusting? Well, because the statute doesn't automatically call for an adjustment of more than 10%. So one way to answer the question is uh, to presume that, or, or you know that there's a 10% adjustment for 90 overnights. 
And if you double that to 180 overnights, you're very close to being equal parenting time because 183 flips you from being an obligor to an obligee, right? So if 90 overnights is a 10% adjustment and 183 overnights is a 100% adjustment, you go to zero, and what's that straight line adjustment? And that's what this button does. This calculates on a continuum what the adjustment from 90 to 180 would be. And you'll see that if I click that, George's support obligation goes down to $38. This is a, just a mathematical calculation. It is, as we say, not in the statute. I call it the overnight extrapolator. Um, it's math, folks. It's not, you know, you can say, oh my God, that's so unfair. $38, how is Marianne gonna live? Well, you haven't seen how much Mar Marianne makes yet. And so what I'm telling you is, this is a really useful tool when the incomes are very close to being equal because you're gonna get that, that parenting time um, adjustment or, or deviation uh, close to zero, because if you have equal parenting time and equal income, it should be zero. I think that's a universal uh, sentiment. I don't think it's law in Ohio yet, but I, in practice, uh, it's a very common outcome. So uh, again, these little buttons, tell you a lot, and then here it t we tell you how we did the math, exactly what happened to um, get that adjustment down to $38 per night. It's basically 1% per night because uh, 180 is two times 90 and it, and it gets you to zero. So again, you click on these little question mark bubbles and look at them all, they're everywhere. You're going to get a lot of help and a lot of guidance as you as you work through the software by clicking on those. You'll notice there's a video right here. That will take you to a training video about this page. If you click on help, that will take you to the frequently asked questions at the company's website about this page. And then again, you can always uh, email uh, the company uh, through the files and settings and you can email John Zoller. Uh, or call me. So there's lots of ways to get help. All right, so this is a really important screen if, if you have children. Um, and I'm gonna move on now. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm gonna, you just, I'm gonna close that carrot because I don't like my screen to be too cluttered. Wages and filing status. I um, this is derived from the company's sample data. So I've been playing with the company's sample data. If you were to go to files and settings, open and save, all the way down here is a sample data set. If you want to experiment with the software and get used to clicking around and you don't want to risk damaging a client's actual data, go here and play around with the sample data. Um, I do that myself to see, to double check what I'm doing to see, see if it's right. Anyway, I'm going to go back, by the way, in the desktop version, there's a back button down here. In the, in the cloud version, you use your browser button to go back. That's one way to go back. All right, so I'm going to, uh, we see now how much Marianne and George make in wages. And George works for a building company and Marianne works for Westlake Schools. Um, they are not over $336,000. So we don't have a income extrapolation issue. But if we did, you'd click here and it would show you uh, the different methods of extrapolation. There are actually two. There's the um, marginal rate of extrapolation and the average rate of extrapolation. You should be aware that some child support enforcement agencies in Ohio use the average rate of extrapolation. And if you have a client who's the obligor in one of those counties, you should click on one of these question mark bubbles because we're gonna tell you why we think that average rate is inappropriate and that the marginal rate is the more appropriate um, extrapolation method. Um, again, over, over $336,000, it's supposed to be a case by case analysis, um, but usually you, you figure out what the extrapolated number is 
because you know that's the worst your clients go, or best your, your clients going to do. That's the uh, outside max. So if I were to click on this, you can see it doesn't change here because we're not over 336. So I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna close wages and filing status and I'm gonna to go to um, wage like income. So I made this up uh, just to illustrate some points. I've got some average over uh, uh, commission bonuses for George. These flow through to um, the uh, Supreme Court form um, and the child support guideline worksheet. Um, this will result in the average of the overtime commission and bonuses. But if you're doing an analysis of future cash flow, lots of people do this. What's the percentage of after tax spendable cash, right? You want to do this all the time. That's why people use the software. That's the second most common reason people use the software after calculating child support. So it's important for you to understand that these bonuses are the projected or future bonuses. This average does not flow through to the projected annual income. So you, you want to make sure that you put a number in here if you expect it to continue in the future and you're trying to calculate future net after tax income. These little boxes are for footnotes and you can see every single one of these items you can put in a footnote and you'll notice that they're empty they're empty and this one's opaque that's your visual clue that there's a footnote there and if you click on that it shows you what the footnote is anticipated future bonuses you can make it bold you can do it as a reminder so nobody sees it but you you can mark it estimated when you're filling out your income and expense affidavit and your client doesn't know how much the car payment is and you want to check estimated for the car payment, this is how you would do it. And this is, that's important because that happens a lot. And so if you want to have your affidavit of income and expenses show an item as estimated, you would click that. And in this case, it would be appropriate to do that because we don't know exactly what the future will hold. Okay. So um, these boxes are the more information boxes. And uh, in this case, there isn't a whole lot to tell us, but in other cases, you might wanna be clicking on those more information tabs frequently. And I'll give you some examples of those a little bit later. Okay, so we've got George's future bonuses and we've got some other sources of income. Marianne's a teacher, so she does tutoring and she drives for Uber in the summertime. And George likes to uh, play with the antiques on eBay and he makes uh, some money on eBay outside of his work. Nothing else here, plays for child's derivative benefits if one parent is uh, disabled, uh, the CARES Act, um, that's about it for this. So uh, you can put in any kind of income you want. By the way, if your clients have assets that are generating income, that will be, that will populate in the child support calculation and the um, financial analysis when you put in the assets. So for, and you can, let me show you that. So I'm going to re remove that. And we've got income from investment pensions and so forth. So there's two places to enter these assets. Here are the, here are the financial assets that George and Marianne have. Here are the values. They're gonna throw off a little bit of income. Wow, it's only worth 12 grand, but it's gonna give you a thousand. That's a really good rate of return. I should probably make that a hundred dollars. Um, anyway, the point is, if you've put in the assets, either here or in the assets and liabilities section, the income from those assets will flow through to both the future analysis of income and the child support calculation. So you're only having to do it once. And again, look at all of the uh, more information and the footnotes. I don't remember what that footnote is. Oh. So this is an example of telling a story to the court or making an argument to opposing counsel of, hey, this is, this is separate property. 
and it's coloring outside the box. It's using the footnotes to tell a story in the forms that you're going to file with the court or give to opposing counsel or your clients so that they know you know what you're doing. So again, that, that's opaque. It tells you that there's something there. More information. Um, this is where you see separate property of Marianne, and this is where you would put in that it's Marianne's separate property. Well, that happens a lot, right? We need to do that frequently. So the place to, to enter separate property or to allocate portions of an asset as separate property is in the more information tabs. Super important, everybody get that? These green more information things are, are really important. The, the software has tons and tons of layers of information and, and the more information is the best way to drill into the deeper layers of the software. Um, okay, so we got here because we were in uh, other income and we were still on child support. Oops. Child support data. I went too fast for my Wi-Fi connection. I can tell because this isn't bright blue. It's it's a um, dusty blue. So my soft my uh, internet connection is not keeping up with us. I apologize. Come on, software, you can do it. It's gonna, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to uh, collapse that carrot. Income from, oh, income from investments, we just did this. Okay, so these two carrots are now, are now two. It used to be that this was one carrot that you opened up. So we've broken it down between child support and spousal support, and it's, to, it's, it's what you want to use to start your work, to do the what if screens and cash flow projections. So the child support, um, pretty straightforward. The software has calculated it, right? You can, you can override that. You could, tell the, you could tell the software, hey, you know, it's $38, but we want to agree that it's zero because it's close enough, right? So you can override the calculated child support uh, it doesn't change the child support guidelines. You haven't done a deviation here, but you have changed the calculation for purposes of the uh, budget report and cash flow projections. I skipped over something. Let's go back to deductions. I, I must admit, I don't know why I missed that. Really important carrot, super important. Health insurance. Um, wherever you put this is going to automatically make that person the health care obligor. It's super important to put numbers in these fields. Um, why it only says dental and not dental and vision, I don't know, but I usually put vision in too. Um, so child care, this is a super important worksheet. Um, we can say that Child care is expensive for these kids and each parent is paying $500 a month. It's $12,000 a year for these kids. And you can see right here is the maximum allowable cost. This comes from the statute. If you wanna know the breaks, we give you the table right there from the question mark. And this, this is important because if you got a kid that's 12 years and six months old, you know, you, you wouldn't, limit it to 720, you probably plan, do your software so that it's, it's uh, the kids aged out. Uh, you want your work product to last more than a couple of months, right? So it's important to know what these age limits are. You can override these by clicking on it and typing in a new button and it will turn red. Uh, by the way, simple visual tool. If it's yellow, it's inviting you to put in a number. If it's blue, it's a calculated entry. You've already given that information to the software from somewhere else or it's calculated it from somewhere else. So we, we went over the cap. This is gonna limit it, the maximum allowable expense. Um, and this flows through to the child support guideline worksheet and, and all of the math is done for you here.
And don't forget to click on these question marks if you have questions. Super helpful. Now I'm gonna hit my back button. So um, I, I had a question yesterday or the day before from somebody about uh, public employees and the, and the point that they, they, wanted to, they wanted to calculate after-tax spendable cash, but the lawyers knew that the, the teacher was not a participant in Social Security. And so they wanted to know how to use the software to make an accurate reflection of that teacher's after-tax spendable cash. So um, I put in union dues, even though it's, it's not really necessary uh, because it's not a child support issue, but it is a cash flow issue. Um, Here we go. Oh, under wages, under Marianne, I click more information. And now on line 11, you can see are Marianne's wages subject to FICA and so forth? No, they're not. They're probably only Medicare taxes. So now we've made the adjustment for policemen, firemen, teachers, and politicians. <laughs> Okay, uh, and public employees. So what have we done now? Well, we've, we've actually increased their income for purposes of cash flow analysis because they're not paying all that other stuff that we pay, right? But they do have other costs because they're in PERS and there's a, there's a mandatory retirement component that's like Social Security that comes out of their check. So you have to look at their... Um, year-end pay stub, their W-2s, uh, and analyze that because you'll want to put in that additional deduction from their income so that when you do the analysis of future cash flow, you're, you're being fair to this teacher because so far all we've done is taken away Social Security taxes and effectively made it look like she has more income than she's really going to. So we've done half of the exercise for a public employee by clicking this button right here. Everybody with me? All right, we're gonna go back. Uh, how did I get here? Again, I clicked more information. It's kind of hidden. It's a little bit buried. You gotta remember, you, got, you know, it's a good habit to just click on these more information buttons just to see what's there. Um, it's a, it's a good place if you need to, you know, it, it can be a, a database for things like employers' addresses and phone numbers too. Um, so get in the habit of clicking that more information button uh, because there's, there's a lot there. Uh, if Marianne had a second W-2 job, you just click that and you'd get a whole nother set of information for her second employer. Okay, uh, deductions. I haven't gotten all the way through this yet. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about mandatory deductions. Okay, worksheet for deviations. This is brand new. Um, I, uh, I asked the company to do this. And this is, uh, this is directly from our statute, all of the deviation factors. I've been playing with it. And what I can tell you so far is that the only way to um, really make this effective is to put numbers negative numbers if you want to de deviate downward and positive numbers if you want to deviate upward under the obligors column. Uh, and this, is, this, is, this worksheet has been around for maybe three weeks. I haven't found a way or, or been able to see an, a, an effect from putting a number in the obligees column. So when you're doing deviations, it's all about the obligors column. If you want to go downward, put in a number that's negative. If you want to go upward, put in a number that's positive. So um, we've got down to zero because of extended parenting time. So that was populated. See, it's blue. It populated from that parenting time extrapolator back, on, back in the beginning of, of uh, child support data. And again, we, we were here with children. We had George getting... 182 to 183, and we clicked on the overnight extrapolator. So I'm just reviewing how we got there, okay? Um, 
I'm going back to where we were, but I'm showing you how you get there, deviations, and that overnight extrapolator carried through to this deviation page. You might have more deviations. You might say, hey, wait a minute, um, George, you need to pay extra because, um, oh, I don't know, pick one. Um, Marianne has extraordinary work-related childcare expenses, and George should uh, contribute to that. So what happened? I just did a deviation upward because of extraordinary work-related expenses that would be Mary Ann's in this case. And you can see that our child support just went up to 538 from $38. So we deviated downwards for overnight, but we went up because of work-related childcare expenses. Well, why would we do that? Um, maybe because you wanna end up, you, you agreed that the ultimate number should be 538. Um, this worksheet, is broken down this way and, and aligns with the statute because you could have a case that ends up having a modification uh, three years later by the Child Support Enforcement Agency. And an administrative review of child support can carry forward deviations if the agency can reasonably ascertain either the amount or the percentage of the deviation. So this is where you're sending the message to those who come after you. A, a CISA review or a motion to modify, a new lawyer gets on the case, or your client calls you up a year later and says, why the hell did you do this? And they think that you sold them down the river and you've got this worksheet to say, well, the reason George is because Mary Ann had extraordinary uh, work-related child care expenses, and you agreed that you'd pay $500 toward them. That's why, George. So it's also a good way to, to protect yourself. So this deviation worksheet <coughs> will come back later. Um, so again, we got there, child support data, we're in uh, deductions, and we go to worksheet for deviations, and that's where that is. All right, we're getting, you know, we've already calculated child support. We did that a half an hour ago. Um, so now we're at the spousal support. There's a lot of hyperlinks here. These blue things do things for you. Um, right now it says 2207. I'm just gonna make that a dollar for now. In other words, I'm creating a place setter. Again, these are clicked to show that it's not going to be income to Marianne and it's not going to be deductible to George. So I'm done. I've gone through all of these carrots. I've got a child support number that I understand and have lived with. You've created child support. I want to know what that does to after tax spendable cash. Well, you click right here, balance incomes after taxes. What you've done is you've jumped to the negotiation tab. And here's the answer. If you wanted to have equalized income for this couple, you'd put 50 in for Marianne and George need to come up with another $2,400 to result in an income equalization. Or 45, 1558 if George were to keep 55%. And if you wanted to say, well, what if it was 40% uh, and hit that, the software will calculate that for you too. And now you've got side-by-side -side analyses of how to um, balance those incomes. You might print this out and take it to a pretrial. You might have this on a laptop when you go to court or uh, to a settlement meeting and be able to show your client instantaneously what, what would be needed to achieve these after-tax results. Um, if you're in certain counties like Summit County, they want to see reports in this format. And that's fine. This is should look familiar to those of you who used FinPlan. Um, this might go away soon because FinPlan's going away in Ohio. Um, and then there's some other options. Uh, you can change options. Uh, if you wanted to do spousal support only, you could click here. So now you're taking the children out um, of, of the equation. Um, there's another better way to do that, but that's one way. And then if you need pretty pictures, you can have pretty pictures. 
okay? So I'm gonna go back and, um, oops, went too far. Uh, we put in a dollar, we went balance incomes. Uh, if you uh, wanna calculate the present value of the as yet unpaid spousal support, because you wanna see if maybe you should do a lump sum buyout, uh, the software is gonna do that for you. Uh, in this case, it's ridiculous because we have such a low amount. So if I put in um, 5,000 and I said it started in this year and it's gonna go for five years, uh, now we've got the present value of that spouse's support obligation. And again, it's 5%. You can wonder why that's 5%. Well, we use a 20 year treasury bill rate. This could change because of COVID and the, our future coming depression. At any rate, um, <clears throat> lots of other uh, hyperlinks here that I'm not gonna get into because I need to get through some more stuff with you guys. So we've completed the client info tab. I went slow. Once you start using the software and you have the data, this is gonna go really fast. The more you use this, the faster you'll get at it, the more confidence you'll have. Uh, and it'll, it'll be, oh yeah, bam, bam, bam. I know I don't need to go to wage like income. I know that I've got some deductions, there's no assets and you just fly through it. Hey John. Yeah. Uh, not to interrupt your flow. If, if you have two self-employed individuals, let's say a lawyer, and a, uh, a nanny or something like that, do you go to wage like income and use that drop down? So um, it's a really good question. You asked me two different questions because one of them is, is in a business and the other person is just a service industry, right? Sure. So let's, let's go back and say um, George's, uh, George doesn't have his job in the, um, come on software, you can do it. It's really not the software, it's my internet connection at home. Uh, George has been going to law school on, on, his, on, the, on the side and he's quit his job there. Boom. George doesn't have that job anymore and he doesn't have the income from it. So I just took that away. Let's double check to see um, yeah, we would want to take these out too. And so now we'd go to assets and liabilities, Brian, and we go to businesses and we'd add a business. So this is gonna assume a business has a value. Um, if you know the value because you had an appraisal, you could put it in there. George is gonna keep all of this, right? Here's where you put in the cash flow to answer your question, Brian. And you can just put in the cash flow number and the software knows that it's self-employment income, uh, I think. So again, the magic more information button I'm on this George's Law Practice. Uh, it's titled The Husband. It will go on husband's affidavit. We could put in that. We've got a footnote. I'm going to click on the magic information, more information button and look at, oh, look at all this detail. View and edit annual business value. If you knew it, you could put that in. Um, Income and expense worksheet. This is really common for people like this, Brian. Uh, you, you, you might get an income and expense worksheet from George, who's a brand new lawyer, and he thinks that he should get to deduct his Cadillac payments and his purchases at Costco and, and everything else he does as a business expense. So you want to you wanna say, no, Brian, that's not how it works. I'm going to do your, income and, your um, income and expense worksheet for your practice myself because you want to do it so that it's not a work of fiction. This is how you could create it. Um, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. You can add lines. 
and you end up with a cash flow statement. So find, you're, you're doing a financial statement for uh, George in this case. Um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here. Um, yeah. So basically to answer your question, you'd put his flow through income here to go to the child support worksheet and the uh, projected future cash flow. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. That's what you do for somebody who has a business like a law practice or a, a, a franchise of something. There's lots of help here. Um, it's kind of beyond the scope of this and we've only got 10 more minutes. So okay. I kind of want to move on, Brian, but here's where you check separate property. George had been a lawyer beforehand. Uh, there's a place where you can put in um, your outside valuation if you uh, have, have the practice appraised. But let's go back um, because you mentioned uh, Marianne having, uh, I forget what you said she did, but uh, you could put that here. So that's, that's you know, the side gig as a, doing nannying in the summer. Would, yeah. You could change that to nannying. Okay. Click on the more information because you want to know what, that doesn't, um, kind of depends on whether Marianne's going to declare this or not. You know, if, if she's not, you'd click not non-taxable. Yeah. This is, this is a cash business and you wanted to know after tax cash. If she's not declaring her Uber money, although Uber does issue W, uh, um, K1s, I think, um, Maybe the tutoring is all cash. So that's how you would do that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, we're done with data entry. Now we want to you know, look at what we can do with this. How can we analyze it? The negotiate tab is the analysis phase. Now you've got the data. You wanna see what happens if you do this, that, and the other thing with it. So really it's follow it like you did the client info tab. You just go down and you look at what you wanna do. Um, the Determining the percentage of after-tax cash in the software, it, we call it balance incomes. It's right here. I already showed you that there's a hyperlink from the child support, what uh, support to use tab that, that gets you there quickly. This is another way to get to that same screen, okay? Um, this is what ifs for support, spousal support, present value, it's the same stuff you saw just in a different place. Divide property, this is a super useful feature of the software. You've put in, by the way, we only did client support data. That's as far as we've gotten. We got all this other data to enter. enter. We, could, we could put in Marianne's STRS plan, right? Um, the software will calculate the present value of a defined benefit plan. Um, I have used it and also used uh, the QDRO group and compared them and they're you know, if the if the um, data going in is the same, the out uh, the outcome is the same. So it's a good way to estimate um, present value of defined benefit plans. Uh, it's not, you know, it's it's a settlement tool. You're not going to get this into evidence without somebody to testify to it. Um, so uh, background and child. This is uh, an answer for the financial affidavit, child support, frequently asked questions. Um, Pretty straightforward. Affidavit inf info. These are the unique fields to the Supreme Court's five standard forms. And there they are. An affidavit header, income and expense, property, parenting, health insurance, and temporary orders. I love this temporary orders. Um, I just love it. And um, pretty straightforward to fill out. We do the health insurance investigation form, the parenting form. Um, income and expense. The only thing that you see here are the fields that are unique to uh, the Supreme Court form that you haven't already filled out in the in the other fields. So it's it's just the short list of what we haven't done yet. Um, income and expenses. Uh, this can get very very granular. You can get down to how much. Uh, somebody pays the babysitter from across the street. Income, ex real estate expenses are, are separated out from living expenses. When you look, click on living expenses, look at all these tabs. So 
this is where you might say to your client, look, you can pay me my hourly rate to fill out your budget for this stuff, or you guys, you can, fill, you can do it yourself and then I'll take it from there. Most of the time people will realize, wow, that's a really good way for me to save money and get you what you need to know. So um, I encourage you to just click through these. I mean, they're, they're, it, you can get extremely granular. Um, These, these fields populate the Supreme Court affidavits too. Okay, I need to move on because we're running out of time. Um, income from assets, we, we talked about that. So uh, once you've worked through these, you're done. Now you're ready to negotiate. I wanted to show you divide property real quick. Um, so we've added all these assets in here, but we haven't said who gets what. Right now, only a few of them are allocated, right? So we're gonna say, uh, George gets this, uh, they're splitting this, they're splitting this. Oops. And so I'm just gonna keep going and I'm gonna fill out, I'm gonna allocate all this stuff. And uh, so what have I done? I've just done a pro forma division of assets. Um, and I think I've allocated everything now. I really encourage you to go up here to the top to the equalization payment and other options. You wanna always see how far apart the parties are and you wanna subtotal the assets because you've got pre and post tax assets together right now. So I've just selected two other options to add to the screen that we were on. And now we've got these additional fields here and we can see that for retirement, we've got a really unequal division. Marianne's getting almost 80%. They're splitting debt equally. And their time retirement is also unequal. If we did all of that, Marianne would need to get another $26,940 from George. So we've figured out what the property settlement payment should be if we did all of that. Now, there's a fallacy in this because, again, we've got uh, pre-tax assets and post-tax assets. And if you just do this, you've combined the two. That's a mistake, don't do it. So if you wanna know what the, what the property division payment should be if the retirement assets were equal, just go down here and change these to equal. And, and you're only doing this for purposes of, of looking up back up at the top, because now we've got retirement assets equal and the, the non-retirement assets, Marianne would need $44,000. So now we're comparing uh, apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Everybody get that? Super helpful tool. When you're sitting with a client, we said, well, he wants the bond fund. What happens if he gets the bond fund? Well. We'll give him the bond fund and now uh, that goes up to 49. So it's, it's a, it's a real time way to mix and match assets to, to find solutions. Um, so this is the analysis tab, uh, property division scenarios, after tax, there are lots more reports. Um, I want to show you spousal support more. There's some neat reports here. Spousal support break even. So um, if you get an affidavit from your uh, prospective obligee and your prospective obligee says, I need this much money to live on, this will calculate how much, how much support that person would need to break even. And all of the details right here. And um, if, if Marianne met her budget, George would be $102,000 in a hole. Whoops, that's not good. All right, I'm done with negotiate. I got to finish up here. Child support's right here. Uh, straightforward, remember yellow, you can type in it. Blue, you can't. Um, we've got our deviation coming in. Here's the child support worksheet. Um, here's the deviation worksheet. Again, we click on that and that's the same sheet that we were on before. Um, I'm going to give you a little, you know, John Zoller's uh, recommendation about good practice. Uh, we didn't deviate 
uh, cash medical. You could go back to the deviation page to deviate cash medical. My feeling is most people are deviating cash medical to zero, even if they still have child support. It's a very rare case for me where we leave that in there. Um, so there are three worksheets within the worksheet. Um, up here is the income. You got these big numbers and, um, wow, what happened? Oh, we took away George's, <laughs> he didn't put any income for his law practice. So he's, he's on the skids, that's why it's so bad. Um, you click this worksheet, it's gonna break down their sources of income. This is important because look at all the different sources of income. I'm gonna put some money back in here for George. Yeah. I'm gonna give George a job. I'm not gonna say much about it. I'm just gonna say makes 180. Child support didn't change. Um, well, reports, child support. So now this, this, these big numbers don't correlate to a W-2. You're not gonna know. And if you're, in the, if you're the attorney down the road doing a modification, you have no idea where these numbers came from. So I strongly recommend clicking on this worksheet, printing this out and attaching it to your guideline worksheet so that you're telling the story of what you did. You can tell the client why it was what it was. Um, and if these sources of income, let's say Marianne's spouse support expires or she loses this other income, um, you know, that would change child support. So you, you need to know what it was so that you know whether there was a 10% change for subsequent modifications, right? So that's one worksheet within the worksheet. I really recommend, unless you just have W-2 income, and each of them have W-2 and that's all they have, um, then I wouldn't bother, but otherwise I would, print, I would print that worksheet and attach it to my guideline worksheet. Here is the uh, work-related child care worksheet. Again, I think that should, you should do the same thing, print it and attach it because kids grow, they age, and they're, and they're gonna age out of these maximal allowable costs. And, and you know, work-related child care is gonna cause a 10% change in, in the appropriate calculated amount because kids are gonna grow out of child care. So I really recommend you print this worksheet and attach it to your guideline worksheet. And then the third one is the deviation worksheet, which is um, right here. And again, if you're deviating, I would, I, would I would print that one out too and attach it to my guideline worksheet so the court understands, well, gee, George is kicking in an extra 500 for, for childcare, but these kids are out of childcare now. You take that out and, and George's, worksheet, George's uh, obligation is now $38, remember? So I can't stress enough, if you don't attach these supplemental worksheets, these worksheets within the worksheet, nobody's gonna know how you got to your conclusion uh, when they look at it down the road. All right, other reports. I love the budget report. I think it tells a great story. Um, you can see that it's gonna show footnotes. That's a, that's a footnote. It shows up down here on the bottom as footnotes. So you can tell stories. This is a side-by-side -side analysis of the party's income and expenses. Um, here's what they make. Here's some um, investment income, some business income, um, gross income per month. We're gonna do their expenses. I think that it's incredibly valuable and a useful exercise to put the other party's expenses into your software. It's a pain in the butt. You might not wanna do it in a granular level. You might wanna just put the gross amount that they say they need on the, uh, from their affidavit. And then you could, you could put in other miscellaneous expenses and you could just put in their gross the total of their expenses from their affidavit, put in a footnote and the footnote down here will say, alleged expenses based on affidavit of August 20th, 2020 by uh, wife. So now we have Marianne's expenses and George's expenses. We've got some other things, Tiffany's going to college, some debt service, child support being exchanged. Um, after it's all said and done and taxes are done, the court can look at this bottom line and go, well, wait a minute. Why should Marianne have a $3,200 a month surplus and George is $1,300 in the hole? 
Well, this example would be one, if you represented George, you'd do this and you'd show it to the court and you say, this is what Marianne's demand is. How could, how could she justify having a $3,200 a month surplus, Your Honor? That would leave my client in the hole $1,300 a month. So it's a great argument tool and it's great side-by-side -side analysis. I use this um, for temporary support hearings. I use it as kind of my um, template for opening and closing arguments and trial. Um, it's the whole income and expense picture on one page for both parties. Um, I'm out of time. Uh, court forms right now, the only form we have here, this is, this is the uh, Title IV-D services application. Uh, you have to do it in every case. The software is gonna populate it um, to the extent you've already entered data. It's all gonna be in here. And this is the data for a Title IV-D services application. Um, so that's what court forms are. We are going to be adding forms to this. There's a couple of new forms. The child support affidavit is being expected in a lot of counties now. Here's, your, your, um, here's where you generate the Supreme Court forms. So if you just wanted the affidavit of income expense for George, you'd click that. You'd go over here and hit a PDF. And now you have George's affidavit of income and expenses. And you can see it's all populated. I do this on a regular basis because I want to see what I missed. And I will oftentimes print this out, look at it, and I'll highlight things that are missing and I'll send it to my client and say, hey, I need you to give me documentation about the things that are highlighted on this fax, uh, on this, uh, this attachment. So it's a good, good communication tool. Um, so those are those reports. There are reports and reports and reports in the marital property division. Remember we had some separate properties, so we'd do that. Mary Ann had a $50,000 separate property interest in the house, so it shows up on the marital and separate property report. There are options to show how and what you wanna show. You can title it. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up with uh, more reports. This software was created to be financial planning software. It's become used more by lawyers than planners, but planners still use it. If you go to planners, you get a whole another list of reports and they go on and on and on. It's a lot about taxes and capital gains on investments. And, and so if you've put the right data in, you can do a lot of things for your client. Um, uh, projected net worth. You know, some clients want to know they're going to be okay, right? Well, if you put in the assets and the income and expenses, and, and in this case, you know, you'd, you'd want to put in um, anticipated Social Security if you're going out that far uh, to make this legitimate. But, you know, if, if, if you're Marianne and you show her this, she's going to go, oh, thank you. I think I'm going to be okay. I'm, at least this isn't diving down to, to zero, right? Um, so if you've put in the right information, uh, it's really useful tools. Of course, you, on assets, you have to make assumptions about appreciation or um, accumulation of, of reinvested dividends and things like that. But so you need to put in the right information in the first place. So that's all we have time for, folks. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Any questions? No? I am going to, um, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and say thank you to you guys. Um, I probably won't do one of these next week, but the week after I'll do another one. Um, I, I don't know what the topic will be. Um, I get a lot of questions and so sometimes I try to adjust these webinars for people who have specific questions. Uh, but if you do, and you'd like me to do, you know, approach, go d deeper dive into something in one of the future webinars, just let me know. Well, thanks, John. Okay, guys. Have a nice right. weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. My pleasure.